Today's webinar is brought to you by Golf 2020's Millennial Golf Task Force. The Millennial Task Force was formed in late 2015 by Steve Mona, CEO of the World Golf Foundation, Chris Hart of NextGen Golf, and Glenn Gray of Buffalo Agency were named the co-chairs. The task force was charged with developing a series of recommendations to increase millennial participation, the number of millennial fans, and millennials pursuing careers in golf. Today, the Millennial Task Force continues to focus on showcasing the game as fun, young, and cool through a variety of committees. One of these is to ensure golf courses are equipped to provide enjoyable experiences for millennials. It is important that owners, operators, and employees make sure they understand what's of interest to this age group and how to communicate with them before, during, and after their visit. On this slide shows a few of the members or organizations the members represent on the task force. Now, I am pleased to introduce Lauren Driver, senior client partner at Twitter. Lauren is a seasoned Twitter veteran with over six years at the company based in the Austin, Sydney, and most recently, Los Angeles offices. Lauren manages the Nestle business in the US for Twitter, responsible for driving over 15 million in annual advertising revenue, working with endless amounts of Twitter data to tell stories and ultimately drive the best business results for her clients. Lauren was selected to the Millennial Task Force to drive interest from a younger demographic, particularly millennials, in the game of golf. She has played competitive golf since age nine, including representing the University of Texas at Austin after walking on her senior year. Lauren, I now turn the presentation over to you. Great, thanks so much, Sarah. Hello, everyone. Excited to talk to you today about social media best practices and really engaging with millennials in this important uh, demographic um, within the golf community. Before we get started, just want to intro who our panelists are today. So actually going to kick it over to Corey to get things started. Hey, guys. Uh, my name is Corey Bradburn. I am the social media manager at Golf Digest. So give us a follow if you don't already. I'll at Golf Digest pretty much everywhere. Uh, I've been with Golf Digest for a little over four years now, and I'm responsible for overseeing all of our social strategy, uh, making sure that we're publishing every platform when, where, and how we should, and uh, executing with our editorial, our sales and marketing team, and our video team. So thanks for having me. Great. We'll kick it over to Preston. Hey, everyone. My name is Preston McClellan. I work at the PGA Tour. I kind of work across a number of different areas of marketing. I uh, primarily work with our players in building their brand, so anything from teaching them the basics of using Twitter to helping them value their social and things of that nature. I work with influencers to help grow the game, people like Paige, who you'll hear from shortly. And then I also kind of work in traditional brand marketing with our agencies to uh, produce a lot of the creatives that you see. So looking forward to talking to everyone today. Thanks, Preston. Kick it to Tony. Hey, everyone. Uh, Tony Santelli. So, um, I'm a digital marketing manager for Adidas Golf. Um, been with TaylorMade Adidas Golf for about eight years now, but now I'm uh, residing strictly on the Adidas side. And so I'm kind of responsible for uh, social strategy as well as more digital aspects as far as e-com and managing emails and things like that. So um, just making sure we are seamless across that entire journey. Great, and last but certainly not least, we'll kick it to Paige. Hey everyone, I'm Paige Sporanek. I'm a golf ambassador and social media influencer. I'm also with CyberSmile, which is an anti-bullying organization that focuses on cyberbullying. So my main goal after playing professionally for a year was to make golf fun. I decided I didn't like the lifestyle on tour, and so I wanted to do social media full-time. And I know it's the wave of the future, and it's the best way to get everyone involved. So I'm really excited to be a part of the Tech Force and to talk more about social media today. Thanks, Paige. So before we jump into the questions that we have prepared, as Sarah mentioned, know that we'll be taking questions throughout the presentation. So if you can type them in the chat box, we will be monitoring those throughout. And then we can also answer them at the end, um, depending on the, the questions that are asked. So um, you know we talked about, we're looking forward to discussing so social media best practices and really how to engage with millennials throughout this presentation. 
we'll actually be using the hashtag grow golf if you're interested in um, sharing kind of the learnings that you get from this presentation as well as seeing the conversation around the topic um, and how millennials are participating in that online we know that millennials are super important target within golf because there's already 6.4 million millennial golfers in the u.s today and we also know that millennials spend a majority of their time on their phone with a large portion of that being on social media so when it comes to social media it can be overwhelming thinking about all of the different platforms how their audiences differ by platform and also how brands should be thinking about each and so that's where we're going to jump in first is really looking at the actual platforms and talking about um, the differences between them and we'll jump into the next question or the first question which would be you know what social media platform do you feel is most impactful for golf and why uh, Paige would love for you to kick this off and um, I think just because you have such a presence across all of the platforms um, and then we'll, we'll kick it over to Preston for his thoughts as well yeah I, I think the most impactful social media platform is definitely Instagram it's so easy to connect with so many different people and it's really quick too so you can just post a video or a picture and it's easy to engage with everyone I feel that um, Facebook is now a bit has an older audience and so to target more of the Millennials and the younger audience Instagram is definitely the way to go it's hard with Twitter because it's just opinion based and a lot of people just want to see a picture or a video and that's why you know Instagram by far my favorite and I think it's going to be the social platform that lasts the longest and will be the most beneficial in the future so I'll jump, jump in this is Preston I think uh, I definitely Instagram is a great platform and I think that I would say it's in a combination of Twitter and Instagram for different reasons obviously uh, the PGA Tour has a great partnership with Twitter where you know people can watch free live golf um, every week which I think is very cool it's very cool to see the younger um, the younger demos that uh, tune into that every week and then in terms of Instagram uh, our players have really embraced the story uh, aspect of that kind of and it's been really cool for our fans to see a day-to-day -day kind of look inside their lives both at the course and off the course so that's been cool to see and then Twitter um, as a whole if you were to ask any of our uh, across our players it's the most prevalent platform and I think that's because most of our golfers are sports fans themselves and when you are looking for sports commentary I think Twitter first Great, thanks guys. And Preston, just being at Twitter, I would love for you to talk to you about how the platform has evolved to actually live streaming things like some of the tournaments and some of the key holes. Um, so you're kind of getting that behind the scenes look of what's going on in the courses. Yeah, absolutely. It's a um, PGA Tour Live on Twitter kind of shows both, you know, you get feature group coverage, so you can follow your favorite players for a couple of holes, obviously, and then you can tune in and watch um, just uh, certain holes at a time. So like last week we had the 17th, uh, whole uh, live stream in virtual reality and you could just are in 360 and you could kind of just tune into that within the Twitter platform um, all day every day so it's cool to see that our players um, will jump in there and kind of tell their fans when they're going to be in the live window as well so it's a uh, it's been a cool thing to see and I'm, I'm sure it will continue to grow great so we've got a question coming in from Ray that's relevant to this topic around platforms and asking what about snapchat so, you know, whether it's Preston or Paige, if you guys want to jump in on your thoughts around, is that a relevant platform for this younger demographic um, within golf? Um, I'll take this one. I I like Snapchat. Um, I've noticed I have a bit of a younger audience on Snapchat compared to all of my other social platforms. Right now, though, they're changing it and trying to make it better, but it's a bit confusing to navigate and work. I think it's going to be great. And so I still keep up with it, but it's it's not a platform that I think is easy to navigate right now. So I think they just need to continue to um, expand on what they're doing, and I think it will be great. But as of right now, it, it it's a bit confusing, and I think a lot of other influencers are moving away from Snapchat and just using Instagram Stories. Thanks, Paige. And I think just for the attendees, I think that's um, a great perspective to kind of see versus the influencer side versus more of the brand side. So hearing kind of Paige versus Preston's opinion on these platforms and how they use all of them differently. So we'll jump into the next question, which is, what is the best way to track all of the relevant conversations around all of the platforms? So Corey, would love to get your thoughts here. Yeah, so um, first, the first thing that comes to mind for me uh, is, 
obviously uh, using your own hashtags is a great way to, um, you know, to track conversations and, and also sort of steer a conversation. Uh, with that, keep in mind that hashtags can be very overwhelming and to be very selective with them. Um, using hashtag golf, for example, on Instagram, that's going to go by so fast because there's, you know, millions and millions of people who use hashtag golf in their photos. But um, an example that we did, that we had done for a few years was, uh, the hashtag why I love this game and it was very much around you know golf course boat photography uh, now we've kind of transitioned into one that we like to use called this is golf um, and if you notice on there we've done that for a little while now and there's uh, you know about I don't, I don't know exactly like seven or eight thousand uh, posts and it's just around you know the game of golf and telling that story so you know for for you guys just it, it's a it's a good way to collect conversation but it's it's something that I wouldn't necessarily abuse um, also just hey, remembering that oh yeah I was just gonna say maybe we just back up um, a quick minute and talk more about like maybe how like what hashtags are and how um, how you guys are thinking about hashtags more from like a strategic sure. too yeah so um, you know what social media 101 a hashtag uh, basically is is a, a word or a phrase that um, you know, when you type in, it becomes searchable within that platform. So um, when you go on Twitter or Instagram and you see um, a hashtag, any user can go in and search um, that particular hashtag and see any media or any posts that come up that also have that hashtag. Uh, the way that we think about it, we're, we're pretty selective, honestly. Um, it, it, I think it can be a very bad experience to just, you know, you hashtags and like you know have comments full of just different hashtags to gain attention. I think it's it's better to be a, a little bit more curated and crafted with them. Um, and the way that we think about it, kind of like I was was saying, is you know if we want to build a community or build like a sub community within Instagram or Twitter around a particular topic, like let's say golf course travel, you know. Um, the, again, the one that we'd used was why I love this game uh, for a very long time. So if you search that on Instagram, you'll see a ton of posts that, that come up. Um, and then uh, just being selective with uh, major news events, because from an editorial perspective, you know, it, it is important for us to, to make sure that we're reaching as many people as possible uh, who are tuned into, let's say, the Masters. Uh, you know, we would use hashtags around the Masters and, and use ones around specific campaigns that we were doing around any of those those key events. Thanks, Corey. Tony, yep. would love to yep. hear your thoughts as well. Yeah, so I mean, I definitely agree with that. I mean, coming from the Adidas golf side, when, when we look at hashtags, I mean, we'll, we'll have our brand campaigns, which, you know, as of right now, is geared for more. Um, but then when we're trying to push products, we really just try to keep it plain and simple, like our hero footwear is Tour 360, so making sure that that's visible when it comes to any time that we're posting about it. So people that are interested or want to see more images um, or more info about the shoe, they can just follow that that hashtag. Um, but as far as, you know, really tracking conversations, I mean, we, we use different tools like um, in the past we've used tools like Meltwater um, or Hubnami or even Sprinkler is the most current one that we're using. And so those tools really give us a good gauge on you know overall sentiment and we can really just track um what people are saying where the negative things are coming in and try to you know jump in where we can and and you know really when we are getting some of those that negative feedback we'll look to kind of intercept that that person's question or concern and, and kind of offline it and talk with them directly and usually you see somebody that you know could have been a hater before is you know kind of turning into um, an advocate for your brand even so Thanks, Tony. We've got some questions coming in that I think are relevant to this topic. So um, from Autumn, how many hashtags would you recommend to be used on a post? Um, and I can definitely chime in here too from a Twitter perspective, but um, maybe we start with, with Corey and get your thoughts on here and then I can jump in as well. Cool, yeah, uh, that's, a, that's a really good question. I would keep it, we, our, our rule of thumb is generally about four or five, um, no more, um, any more than that it gets overwhelming and probably is out of the range of, of who you're trying to reach, uh, especially on Instagram. And then on, on Twitter, Lauren, I, I'm sure you can speak more to this, but, but really it's just one or two on Twitter whenever we do use them, especially if we're covering a tournament. You know, we, we might 
use the hashtag that, that the tournament's using as well to just be a part of that conversation. Um, but we certainly don't want to look or feel like we're spamming people with, with a bunch of hashtags because to me that just doesn't feel human. <laughs> so, Absolutely. Um, but yeah. The thing I would add to that too is that I think a lot of times brands and even you know people posting in general forget that a hashtag is actually a clickable a clickable item um, and so what we talk about at twitter is that it's it's a bit of a distraction if you have a goal in mind for the post so as an example if you're posting a video most likely the goal of that post is for the user to watch the video and if you have a hashtag in the post it actually links off elsewhere to see what the conversation is so there can be um, an element of distraction there um, so depending on kind of the goal of of the content of the post, there's times we would actually recommend not including a hashtag and kind of depending on on what it is so autumn hopefully that's helpful yeah, can i say one more thing about that absolutely um yeah, what we always do is we put the hashtag, you know, it's almost a separate, when we use them, we don't use them in every post, by the way, it's probably, I would say maybe 10 or 15% of, of the time. Um, but, but we definitely separate them from the actual uh, caption that, or the copy that we're using. Uh, Cause again, like you said, Lauren, we don't want it to d distract from the message or the context around it. We'll just kind of use it to be a, a feature that people can find us a little bit easier and for us to track conversations around that hashtag as well. Absolutely. Great, so let's move on to the next question. We're gonna talk a little bit more about unique tactics and wanted to kick this off with Preston. Um, can you tell us about an example of a golf course or a golf professional who's great at social media and kind of what they do that makes them unique and, and why they're doing a good job? Yeah, for sure. I'll stick to what I know and uh, go with golfers here. So. Um, I'll give you two of our players, I think, do a really good job on two different platforms. So I think Tony Finau um, is a really relatable guy on Instagram. Um, he's a father of four, um, kind of travels around and while playing great golf, also really kind of tries to live um, and check out each city and what's unique about each city. So whether that's um, going to great restaurants or um, doing something else local to that area, he always kind of gives fans a little insight into that. And that combined with his practice on course, his family life and everything is just a really cool, um, you really kind of feel like you're friends with Tony, even if you've never met him before through his Instagram account. And then I think uh, Dustin Thomas is phenomenal on Twitter. He does, I mean, he's the number one player in the world now, and he still does impromptu Q and A's with fans where he just, you know, might be bored waiting on a flight or something. And we'll just open up his, um, his mentions to, to answer questions from fans. And I think that that's just really cool. If you could imagine that, you know, that simply wasn't possible a decade ago to talk to the number one player in the world um, and kind of pick his brain on things. So those are the two players I think that do a really good job. Thanks, Preston. Tony, any examples come to mind for you? Yeah, for sure. So, I mean, I'll, I'll keep it specific to our um, Adidas golf athletes, but I think um, Sergio Garcia does a really good job on Twitter. I mean, I think we all saw what happened during the Masters um, this year for him, but he was able to kind of take some of the flack that he was getting on Twitter and retweet some people and even like poke fun at himself um, with some of the memes that were coming in. So, you know, just sh kind of showing how well he handled that, I think definitely helped um, just how he is viewed on social media. Um, a lot of our LPGA athletes do really well on Instagram, uh, like Danielle Kang and Paula Creamer and uh, Jess Corda. So um, they're probably the most active on Instagram as far as our stable of athletes go. Um, and so they're, they're great as well as far as engaging with um, the comments that come in and, and things like that. Um, and then even down to uh, a new kid that we signed, Joaquin Neiman, who's 19, just turned professional. Um, I think he's more representative of how, you know, his age group is treating social media these days, where he's posting every once in a while um, in his feed on Instagram, but he's super active on Instagram stories. So whether he's out at the range or out with his buddies, um, he's constantly showing that through his Instagram story, which, uh, yeah, like I said, I think is, is more representative of how the way things are going right now. Thanks, Tony. Paige, we would throw you in this group as already being great at social media, but anyone else you want to highlight that comes to mind? Yeah, I think Fandon Dunes, they do an incredible job on social media for 
a golf course or pictures of a golf course to have, you know, over 30,000 followers, I think is amazing. They really turn their Instagram into a work of art. So the pictures that you see, you want to go there, you want to be there. And I think even people who don't know golf or even really like golf will still want to go visit Band and Dunes because it just looks like an amazing place. They also work really well with their influencers. So I first found out from Bandon from seeing my friends, you know, play the golf course, post pictures, and I feel like they're always trying to bring people in and really just showcase, you know, the golf course. And I also think, you know, any of the influencers out there right now who are trying to do something a bit different, so you have like hole in one trick shots, so he's really great at, you know, bringing new people in. You have uh, Brody Smith, who's Frisbee, but he also loves golf and will, you know, bring new audiences in, and as well as, you know, Nile Horn, who can bring all the young girls into golf. And I think anyone who is bigger than golf and can bring people to golf, I think that's the most important thing. Thanks, Paige. So we've talked at a high level about the platforms that are kind of falling in the social media bucket, and then we've talked about who's doing it well. Um, from an influencer standpoint, and Paige called out, you know, Bandon Dunes, which is great. Would love to jump into the next section about actually building successful campaigns so that we're hopefully helping your brand um, move forward and being able to target these millennials. Would love to start with a question that's come in actually from Mary Kate that says, how important is it to post every day across the channels and does the frequency of posting affect your brand. I think this goes into a lot of the topics we are planning to discuss in this section. Um, so I would love to kick it um, to Tony to kind of to, to address this. Yeah, that's a perfect segue to where I was going to take this. I mean, kind of our motto with this is mean more by doing less. And so, you know, in the past where we, you know, look to just put an image up or try to address something as fast as we can, now we are really taking a step back and looking at our Instagram feed as a layout and looking at the relevant times that we should be posting. Um, and it's just trying to make sure that the images that we push out there are the most impactful that they can be. Um, and I think, you know, it, this goes across the globe, really. We have, um, basically, we, we have this entire kind of global strategy where we were Adidas Golf, but we also had Adidas Golf UK and um, Korea and Japan and things like that. So in order to be more effective across the world, we, we initiated this kind of global social strategy to where all regions are now tied into one, the main Adidas Golf handle. And so we're pushing messages um, specifically around the globe in their specific regions, but it's all coming from one handle. So it's a lot more impactful. Um, but I think to that point, making sure that, you know, the images and the timing that we're pushing things out are the most impactful. And if that means that you don't post for three, four days, it's not the end of the world. Thanks, Tony. Corey, any thoughts from your side on this topic? Yeah, uh, echoing a lot of, of what Tony said that, you know, social media is a very, very large uh, ethos or environment now uh, and to be very selective and very curated with the quality of what you post matters more than ever before but that said uh, I think it really depends on um, you know what is available to you like from an editorial perspective we're, we're constantly in the news cycle every day so you know it's, it makes sense for us to post a lot on Twitter but if we posted every single piece of content on our Instagram feed, people would get overwhelmed and, and the reach and, and the impact of each of those posts would drop. So it, it depends a lot on what you have to work with, but I think it is much more important to make sure that whatever message you, you're delivering across each platform is in line and very, very much in the same bucket um, everywhere. So kind of like what, um, what Tony was saying, it, it, it makes more of a difference to focus on quality because nothing beats, you know, quality content. And that, that definition of what quality is depends on, you know, the audience you're trying to reach. And if we're trying to reach young people, obviously we want it to be entertaining, uh, fun, and informative, but also, you know, within the, the values and the tradition of the game. So uh, it's, it, I, I would say quality matters way more than quantity, but if you do fall off for too long, like five or six days, four or five days without posting, you're going to lose traction. So just be sure to not, you know, lose your momentum 
while you, while you give give the, the bits and pieces of breaks uh, in time from posting. Great. Thank uh, yeah, I can try. I can chime in here from the league side too. And I think that Corey, the point you made there about uh, doing what you have in terms of what you have available is a good point. So uh, I de we definitely view it a little bit differently at the tour um, because we have um, so many of our players and our fundamental fundamental uh, mission as a league is to kind of give our players exposure. So we publish frequently and often across all platforms, probably more frequently I would imagine than most of the brands on this call. And uh, that's not just like say that one is right and one is wrong. It just really depends on the inventory available. And one of our fundamental things that we do is publish highlights so that um, we don't expect fans to essentially have to tune into the broadcast to see everything that they want to see. So um, we do things like Snappy TV with uh, with Lauren and Twitter, where we publish highlights in real time as they happen. We publish uh, you know the best highlights on Instagram, and then we do like round recaps and things of that nature on Facebook. And then I'll also echo kind of what Corey said at the end there is that there are algorithms now, especially on Facebook and Instagram, that kind of govern what you see. And it, you definitely need to be careful by not promote, not posting, um, not by not going too long without posting. Um, and you know, a lot of us on this panel are lucky to work with brands that have really large followings. So if we don't post for a few days, it's okay because we do have that existing audience. But um, if you're working at a local club or a, a, you know, a smaller brand or something like that, consistency does have a little bit more value in my opinion. Thanks, Preston. Actually, Preston would love to throw one of these questions that just came in to you um, from Kelly. She says, as a golf event, what is the best way to stay relevant during the remainder of the year? So I think because you do focus on so many events and obviously you have a little bit of a um, an advantage um, with having you know very large events, but would love any advice um, for Kelly you have there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's a, something that we work with our tournaments on. You know, we like to stay with our tournaments and our children at the tour that we love, uh, or our tournaments and our players that we love all of our children. I got ahead of myself there. Um, but we work with our tournaments to kind of help them keep their, uh, you know, the year on uh, content fresh. And there's some t simple tactics, like obviously having a content calendar where you schedule things ahead of time, but then having someone that um, is, that is available at the golf course where the event is taking place throughout the year to create content is really, really helpful. So simple things like updates on the maintenance of the course, if there's small changes to the clubhouse, you know, quick hitting interviews with the superintendent, club pro, things like that, um, you know, Instagram lives with those people throughout the year. So really, um, if you have a resource on site at the location where the event will be taking place, it really enables you to create a lot more content. Thanks, Preston. We'll take a few more questions um, within this topic because I think that these are really relevant. Um, we've got another one from Ali that says, what's the best strategy to increase followers organically, especially with people who will engage? Um, let's see, I would love to, to kick this off to kind of Corey and, and Tony um, to get your thoughts. Um, the first thing that comes to mind for me, especially for some of the, the smaller, um, you know, platform that, that that doesn't have necessarily the the recognition of a huge brand is to to really engage in the community you're looking to be a part of. So actually actively uh, liking other people's posts, commenting, um, being being a user of social media as well as um, you know a publisher. Uh, I think that that makes a huge huge difference in just creating awareness and and it gives people who you're trying to reach that that little sense of oh this this person actually cares about what i post too so it's got to be a two-way street especially early on um and then to take that at a, a slightly higher level to to work with other uh people or brands with larger platforms you know like doing work with influencers um doing work with other you know even like local businesses in your area that, that might have a larger social following or you are very much in line with uh, the message that you're trying to send to your audience as well. And just being able to, to use their audience that they already have to, to kind of draw people into what you're doing. And back to also the, the original point of that, that having really high quality content. So when you do reach out to these people and they come to your feed and they see what you have and see what you posted and it, it's going to line up with what they're already uh, looking for. So um, I would say just being a, initially being a part of the community and then um, the next step after that would be the, a little bit of outreach to, to other influencers. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, that's, I 100% agree with everything that Corey just said there. I mean, 
constantly engaging, whether it's liking, and I think especially on Instagram is, is more impactful just to leave a quick comment, even if it's like a little emoji or something like that. But I think that goes a little bit further um, than just even a like. But yeah, constantly engaging if it is, you know, like a golf course and you do have some higher, you know, people with high, a lot more followers, like influencers or even athletes, something coming out, you know, trying to get in touch with them and seeing if they'll tag and share like what's going on in your course, or even if it's a shot of the hole or something like that can, can definitely go a long way. Thanks, Tony. Uh, Paige, would love to kick this question to you that just came in from Cole, um, because I think it, it goes, it builds off of your comment about Band and Dunes and how they do a great job of kind of showcasing um, what they're all about and some of the, um, the beauty around their course. His question is, as a golf course operator, how would you suggest that they um, actually drive rounds of golf to the facility as opposed to more boosting more the brand awareness side of things? So how do we kind of turn those people into thinking that they're great photos and actually getting them to, to come try the course? Well, I, I mean, I think they go hand in hand. Um, I, I saw Bandon being beautiful, so I wanted to go there. So I think you have to find – it has to look appealing. So take pictures, have people out there take pictures. I know one thing that's really important to me is that content needs to be very organic, and it needs to feel genuine. And you can kind of get a feel of someone or a golf course or a company – based off of their Instagram. And so if a course looks fun and it looks, you know, me, I like courses that are more laid back. And so if you're showing people having fun out there or maybe, you know, True North, they just got um, different, uh, those uh, golf boards, they just got golf boards and that looked really fun and they showed that and they showed people riding it and it looked like they were having so much fun. But I think you just need to show the highlights of every single day and I think people will start to go there. You can also bring influencers in. So say I'm at a golf course, I post a picture and I said I had a great day out there. I know I get thousands of comments of people saying, what's that golf course like? I want to play there. Tell me more about it. And so I think just having people there, showing them how great it is, people will automatically just want to go out there and play the course. Great idea. Thanks, Paige. Yeah, this is uh, Tony. If I could jump in real quick. I um, totally agree with Paige there. I think another thing that can help kind of boost, I mean, this kind of goes to the previous question as well, but surprise and delight. So, you know, from, you know, a brand side or even if you are like a golf course side, if you do see comments coming in of something like, hey, you know, like love this course, would love to play there. And, you know, reaching out to that person saying something like, hey, yeah, next time you're in town, you get a round on us or something like that, depending on that person's reach and everything, like they're going to go scream from the rooftops about that and they're going to tell everybody they know about that. So I think, you know, surprise and delights definitely go a long way as well. Thanks for the addition, Tony. I think that we've talked a lot about organic content across platforms. Um, one thing we haven't talked about yet that I would love to kick off a discussion around is more of the paid versus unpaid side of things. So um, should people be, or should brands be using both paid and organic um, and why? And Preston would love to get your thoughts here. Yeah, for sure. Obviously we do a little bit of everything. Um, in terms of you know paid media, we do that a lot to drive specific actions. Um, so if, for example, Saturdays and Sundays, we run tune-in campaigns with Twitter, and we're gonna start doing with Instagram stories uh, soon, where we run just like a, a very targeted um, campaign at casual sports fans and other people on, on those platforms and basically say, you know, tune in now to NBC or CBS or wherever the tournament's being uh, telecast on um, and give, you know, specific links to PGA Tour Live or, um, get specific links to tauth.com or any of the other businesses that we own. Um, but one of the things I always like to say is that there's a, a book by Gary Vaynerchuk. It's really a quick read called Jab, 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 Right Hook. And that's kind of how I approach paid media. And basically it's like you're using your organic content to kind of get people interested, you know, give them the highlights, the, the player information, the behind the scenes stories to get them to follow you. And then when you have a call to action, an actual ask of the audience, um, that's typically where you'll want to put paid media behind it for a lot of reasons in terms of uh, like algorithms on Facebook and things of that nature. But let's say, you know, I post a highlight, a player story, and then I want to ask fans to sign up for our email database. I'm probably going to use paid media on that on that final ask, if that, if that makes sense. It does. Tony would also love to get your thoughts on the Adidas side. Yeah, for sure. So, I mean, um, 
I think definitely from like Preston's perspective and maybe even Paige, I mean, the, the organic reach that they're seeing come in on their feeds is, is probably a little higher from the, from the brand side. I mean, we, we look more to pay. I mean, we see, depending on the post that we're putting out, one to 15% is what, of our audience is what we're reaching um, organically. And so in order to get, you know, our brand message out there, show off a product or just overall brand awareness, like you got to pay to play. So it definitely goes a long way to, um, you know, we have a huge um, paid strategy over here. So it's, you know, certain products, certain times of year, tournaments or athletes, things like that. Like we're, we're constantly pushing paid um, products. So, you know, while you will get, you know, from the brand side, that occasional hit that goes off um, organically as far as engagement is concerned, um, it's definitely a pay to play space for us. Thanks, Tony. I want to take another question that came in from Ray um, talking about, do you recommend posting the same information on each platform or customizing depending on the platform? I think this is a really important uh, question to address. Uh, Corey would love to start um, with your thoughts. Ray mentions he currently customizes depending on the platform, which um, I can speak to Twitter's perspective as well, but would love to kick things off with you. Sure. Yeah. Uh, well, Ray, I think you're doing the right thing by customizing each platform. Um, you know, each each one has a certain sort of accent to the overall language of social media, if you want. Like, um, and each platform has better or better dimensions for a photo or a video that you should use, and maybe a little bit different language. And people's usernames are different on Instagram versus Twitter, so you always it, it's always better to craft each post for that specific platform uh, but that doesn't mean you can't use the same piece of media in each one so um, you should definitely if something's relevant to your entire audience you should definitely address it within each platform that you're on but at the same time it should be optimized for that platform um, just so you can you know get the best reach out of it and it also shows to your audience that you're not just you know copy pasting and you know linking and posting it really quick just to get it up and again that goes back to the the theme of quality that we've we've all kind of touched on absolutely thanks Corey I think um, I can chime in from a Twitter perspective um, but knowing how your users engage across platforms is really important so thinking about Twitter what we see perform best is more of the shorter quick bursts of, of the tweet copy. So when you're getting into paragraphs and paragraphs of content that may perform well on other platforms, that isn't necessarily what users are used to on Twitter. Um, and so thinking about, you know, shortening your, your tweet copy and those sorts of things has been something that, it might be a minor change across platform, but thinking about the way that your users engage across each of them will be really important. I um, want to take another question from Tyler. Um, who asks if, if and how there's been any of you have had success um, around using some of these live platforms, so Facebook Live, Instagram Live, Periscope on Twitter, those sorts of things. Um, Preston, I don't know if you want to kick that off, and then we can uh, share with the group. Yeah, for sure. Um, we obviously mentioned our, you know, uh, the live partnership with Twitter, and then we also do um, periscopes or go live on Twitter where we do almost all of our press conferences every week, every week will be both on Facebook live and or on Twitter um, live streaming as well. And um, we have the Twitter live partnership. We're starting to uh, kind of do Instagram lives where we maybe like walk the range as people are warming up and things of that nature. And one kind of just random thing we found about Instagram live, if you have an Instagram story and you go live on Instagram at the same time, you get two circles at the top of the, at the, at the top of the app and then as, as silly as that seems in, in terms of getting people's attention, it tends to work. Um, we notice like when you go live on Instagram, that there's been a bump in the viewership of a story as well. So um, we definitely use uh, live as much as possible. I think that, you know, when you start to think about the future of social media, all three of the platforms that we've been talking about the most, and you throw on YouTube and Snapchat as well, are all kind of, uh, you know, gearing up more and more live and episodic content. So I think that uh, we have to continue to innovate and try more things there. And Preston, maybe as a follow-up to that, thinking about, you know, who's on the call and some of them running events or um, running courses or golf courses, how would you suggest that they use um, those live elements? Like what kind of content would you recommend that they capture in those in that sense? Yeah, for sure. I mean, one 
idea that comes to mind for golf courses is we've had really good success when we go live when we're setting up the golf course in terms of like where we're cutting pin locations or why we're setting up the tee box at a certain location. Um, last year at the Players Championship, we did a, um, I think it was a Facebook live um, where we went out with the agronomy crew as they kind of got the 17th hole ready for the day on Sunday and explaining like why they're cutting the pin, how it was being cut, what the slope were, uh, what the slope was looking like, what the step meter reading was, um, things of that nature, like the up close and personal stuff um, at, at golf courses and events that people, because um, if, if someone's following a golf course, they're obviously like a pretty solid hardcore golf fan. So that's the type of content that they're gonna be looking for. Thanks, Preston. So looking at these social initiatives online, how can we scale them more broadly, whether it's you know on the course or email marketing or other things that these um, brands and courses will be doing? Paige, would love to get your thoughts here on how um, we can scale kind of offline and bring, or online and bring it more to the offline. Yeah, so one thing that I've always found really interesting is golf almost seems to have a cap of followers when it when it's on social media. So Ricky Fowler is probably the most popular player out there. I feel like everyone knows who he is. He's always on TV, always up on the leaderboards. Yet on Instagram, he only has 1.4 million followers, which is definitely a lot. But if you compare it to someone like a Steph Curry or a LeBron James, they have upwards 20 million, 30 million. And so I've noticed that golf doesn't really reach outside of that golf community. And so something that's really important to me is to work with partners who are in, within like the sports world or, you know, close to what I'm doing, but not necessarily always golf related. So I've done work with the Chive, Barstool, Total Frat Move, which are, you know, they have that, that audience that I think we're all looking for. Um, but it's, they're not within golf. And so it's a way to bring new people in golf and you can scale it that way. I think it's working with partners, um, trying different things. I've noticed that I've seen some kind of different content within the golf community, but sometimes there's backlash because, you know, golf is somewhat traditional and they like the same kind of stuff. And I feel like people need to kind of break out of that, try new things, because that's how you'll get new people into golf. And that's what we're after in, you know, in the Millennial Task Force is to get, how do we get more millennials playing, uh, a m more diverse crowd? How do we do that? And I think that comes from the content that we're posting. If we keep posting the same thing over and over again, we're just going to have the same people there. If we do different things and we work with different partners, then we'll have more people coming in and go, wow, golf is really cool. I want to try this. I want to do this. And I think that's what we need to do. Great advice. Thanks, Paige. Uh, Tony, would love to get your thoughts here, too, of thinking about those on the call, again, that are kind of course management. Um, how can they think about extending, you know, what they're doing on the course, whether it's even having their handles on, you know, the cards or anything like that? Um, any advice you have there? Yeah, I mean, um, that that's definitely one tactic for sure. Um, again, kind of even going back to the paid tactic, um, that's going to help push your initiatives as well. And I mean, you know, as far as only targeting certain people that live in a certain area or like you can even get so granular down to like incomes as well. Um, so that can definitely help as well. Email, um, we're, we're doing a ton of that obviously. So that's, that's another way to help push um, the overall initiatives. And then within the emails, not only pushing in, uh, you know, whatever the message is, but also like at the bottom keeping it, you know, hey, follow us at Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, things like that. Great. So we've got five minutes left till we're going to kind of take more broad Q&A. So I want to make sure we get into things like measuring success. Um, so I would love to kick this off with talking a little bit more about the type of content that works best on social, probably depending on your objectives, um, but would love to hear from an influencer perspective page on your side and then Corey more from a brand perspective of um, what content works best and how you kind of are measuring that success. So the content that works best for me and what I've noticed is very, again, we always say this authentic organic content. And I've noticed that I've done a lot of shoot with other companies and it's very overproduced and, and or I'll work with another influencer and it just, it doesn't seem real. It seems fake. And 
my audience is smart. <laughs> they know when I'm trying to sell them something. They know when it's not me. I, you know, I've, I've built a pretty loyal group of followers, and they like to see something that's real. And so I shoot all of my videos with my iPhone. Um, I'm never doing anything over edited or anything that seems, you know, too overproduced. And I notice that works well, you know, even if it's just like a selfie video of myself talking, they really want to know who you are. They want to know your story. They want to know, you know, they see you on social media, but they really want to know the person you are. They want to, you want to be relatable to them. So I always talk about things that I'm going through. I, I don't try to paint a perfect picture of my life. I talk about, you know, the bullying that I've gone through, I talk about my anxiety, I talk about things that everyone struggles with so I can relate to them, and then I feel like I have their trust, and once you have your followers trust, they're a fan for life. And I always take the time to, to if I get a, a, a message, I take the time to respond back to them, and it's just getting that, you want to feel like you're in a friendship with them, and so that comes down to like the content you're posting, really real and organic, and if something's overproduced, I don't post it, and I always focus on quality over quantity, and it needs to be good. I want to make sure that's something my followers like, because I'm doing this for them. I have a job because of them, and so I know what they like, I know what they don't like, and I always want to make sure I'm putting stuff out there that makes them happy, that makes their day better, that's something that they can engage in. Thanks, Paige. Corey, before you jump in, um, would love for you to address um, a question that kind of goes with this, which is, you know, there's obviously an uptick in video content across all social platforms. So what would your recommendation be, you know, for video in general versus photos and GIFs and those sorts of things? But then she, Brittany has a specific question around using captions on videos, knowing that a lot of times these users are scrolling through their timelines and more in a sound off environment, there, there's times where they may not be able to turn on the sound. Um, so how important is, you know, using captions and those sorts of things? Yeah, uh, it's very important. There's a, a much higher retention rate. Uh, so people will stay on your video longer when they see captions because much like you said, a lot of these, uh, all the social platforms now I think are default uh, on mute uh, unless you actively unmute the, the video. So having captions keep someone's attention, uh, it gives a little bit more context, and that's just how people are consuming video on social media now. Um, on Facebook, you, there is a, you can have captions generated automatically once you post a video, um, if you're using a, a page, um, which is nice. Instagram and Lauren, I don't know if Twitter or Snap does that yet, um, but I don't believe so. Um, so if you, it's not always important, but it is helpful if it's easy to do. Um, if it's if it's a huge lift and you know you're a small operation, um, you know maybe that's not where your focus goes right away. And it's shorter videos that are a little more eye catching, or just something that has like a a title or some text that isn't necessarily a caption up above the, or below the video, uh, just to get somebody to you know sort of stop scrolling uh, and just see and 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 stop and read what what's going on with the video. Uh, and then obviously the short, I know that Lauren had, had mentioned that shorter text works well on Twitter. I, we also have found that, you know, GIFs uh, that, re, that are almost reactions or in the moment of, of what's going on in the tournament have been very successful for us as far as uh, getting more retweets and more engagement, um, you know, during an event. Thanks, Corey. Yep. Uh, and then do you want oh. Oh, okay, go ahead. <laughs> no worries. I, with the time we have left, would love to get, you know, kind of go around the horn of the panelists and just understand your thoughts around what's next for social media. It kind of goes along with a question asked by Michael around what's the next big thing once Instagram runs its course. So, Preston, kick it to you to kind of kick off, you know, what you think is ne next in social media. And once we go around all the panelists, I will um, go through some of these other remaining questions and make sure we get as many answers as we can. Yeah, for sure. Um, I think I kind of alluded to it earlier, and I think it's just as all of the platforms, you know, Facebook owns Instagram, so I sort of think of them as one and the same as that company uh, continues to innovate and try to figure out where it's going next. But particularly Facebook and Twitter are both um, investing in content, both live and episodic. So Twitter, you know, at the New Fronts recently just re announced a plethora of new partnerships with ESPN. They renewed with PGA Tour, renewed with NASCAR. 
all these things where they are becoming a rights holder and they're actually going out and purchasing rights to stream live sporting events and creating live, lots of uh, content around that. And then Facebook at the same time is going out and creating Facebook Watch where they're creating, you know, things like um, the, you know, the, law, the ball family show with the LeVar Ball and, you know, Marshall Lynch's show and things of that nature, which are driving really significant viewership and kind of changing the way um, millennials in our generation consume content. You know, I'm one of the uh, dreaded cord cutters and I don't, you know, I watch, the only thing I really watch on the big screen is, is live golf now and pretty much everything else is, is consumed on on the platforms that we're talking about not, about now and, and YouTube as well. So I think that the future of social media is really probably not social media and more just regular media as it, you know, just becomes a part of, of normal everyday life and we stop separating it from TV and it just becomes one and the same. Paige, what about your perspective? I mean, Preston said it perfectly. I mean, people aren't even watching TV anymore. The way that they get their entertainment is through social media. And I think one thing that has to happen is that companies need to feel more comfortable using social media as a way to market. You know, no one's really looking at billboards anymore. You know, everything's through your phone. And I think that's, that's the way of the future. I, I couldn't say it better than what Preston said. It's just, it, it's, I don't think people even have figured it out now. I <laughs> think it's the wild west of what it is. No one really knows how to use it or how, how the potential of social media. And I think that, it's really important to get ahead of the curve and start using it now, um, incorporate it into everything that you're doing, because that's how you're going to get new people involved in whatever you're doing, and that's how you connect with people. Corey, I'll kick it over to you. Yeah, um, I'm not really sure what the next platform or next big platform is, but I do know that very much what, uh, along the lines of what everybody said already, um, on top of that, what you can do as as a brand or as a page is, is build community. I think that's a, a big buzzword that's gone around in a lot of the meetings that I've had with various uh, social platform uh, offices or operators. Um, and that's just, that includes, you know, things like Facebook is really utilizing its groups feature again. So if you have a page, build a Facebook group and make it a sub-segment of, um, you know, a specific topic of whatever you're doing and you know drive a conversation around that like ours we have you know on our courses and travel we have uh, places to play and it's a much smaller group than our overall Facebook page but it's very communal and and they support each other there's, there's a lot of interaction um, and people are able to relate and connect with each other and not just you as a brand and I think that's just going to become more and more important as as these platforms continue to grow and evolve and, it's, and you're able to share just discussions, conversations, and even, you know, your reactions to the media that you are seeing on these social media platforms. So um, that's what I would say is next, is, is getting it as, as tight and as deep in your community as you possibly can, as opposed to trying to focus on getting wide. Thanks, Corey. Tony, closing thoughts on kind of what's next for social media? Yeah, so I, I think definitely agree with what everybody's been saying. Um, I think as we're still getting into it, videos, there's more and more video content, whether that's, you know, creating one big 30 to 60, 60 second spot and having takedowns from that, that, you know, are able to drive back to that. Um, I do think live, you know, I don't know if anyone's perfected live yet. So I think, you know, that that's still definitely on the rise. Um, as far as pushing video content on Facebook, I mean, there's things that have come out as far as like their, their actual reporting on, on views. Um, so, you know, what we've actually noticed is more of an uptick in engagement on Twitter. So I could definitely see, you know, in the near future that, you know, Twitter's definitely coming back and making more of a game more ground on, on the other uh, platforms. Um, and then YouTube. I mean, I think one thing that's never going to go away is golfers looking up swing tips. And so, you know, making sure that you're pushing your message there, is, I think, will definitely be key. And Tony, that kind of leads uh, right into a question from Cole, He's actually asking specifically about YouTube. I think throughout this discussion, we, that hasn't really come up yet. 
So are there ways that um, Cole should be thinking about YouTube differently? I think from a Twitter perspective, YouTube's more of a destination platform. You go there knowing that you're going to be searching for something as opposed to some of these other platforms are more of a timeline environment. So you come not exactly knowing what you're going to expect or see. Um, so is there any recommendation to Cole about you know, how YouTube content can be different, more of this stored environment? Yeah, I think you hit it on the head. I mean, it's really the the main destination. So, you know, these those longer, you know, obviously you can't get past 60 seconds on Instagram, but, you know, if you're pushing a three to five minute spot on a video on Twitter or Facebook, you know, 99% of people aren't going to watch past the first, like, 15 seconds. So, you know, really just making sure that you have kind of um, – a takedown from that video that's really impactful and gets to the point within the first, you know, six seconds, um, and then kind of having a message to drive to YouTube to watch the full video or what have you. So I think that's um, definitely one way to, to do that. I think we look at influencers like, um, if anyone's heard of me and my golf, two guys out of the UK who post a lot of swing tips, um, but they're they're all like pretty short, quick tips, and they're always saying, hey, follow us or hit our website or YouTube to, to see more in-depth videos. Great. Thanks, Tony. Um, I know we've got about one minute left where we need to close up. I think it would be great to end with a question from Adam. And Paige, this is directed at you. Um, he mentions that you talked about making golf fun. Um, and he asked, what are some of the main initiatives you see happening right now that are making the game more fun? And I think an important part of his question is also, like, what initiatives are lacking right now? So would love your thoughts um, on that to close of our segment i think it's how people interact within the golf community um i know that sometimes i'll see something posted and it will relate more to a younger audience and all of the comments are extremely negative and my hope is that you know people can work together to delete those comments and kind of create a more positive community within the golf industry and we need to do a better job of showing more diversity. I mean, posting kids hitting golf shots, posting women, talking to women, um, just engaging with more people. It's There's nothing out there. And I've noticed that, you know, a lot of um, girls now are starting to post on their social media, and it's great, but then all the comments are really negative, and it kind of discourages these girls to want to get into the game because, they're like, wow, you know, why would I want to be a part of a community that's so negative and so mean? And so I think together we need to make an effort to be more opening. So things that I do is I'm with CyberSmouth's anti-bullying organization. So I go to different schools and I talk to them about what anti, you know, what bullying is. And then I also talk about what golf is. So I'm trying to incorporate that together and I'll do a ton of golf clinics and I'll go to Boys and Girls Club and I try to go to places that aren't necessarily golf. So people who haven't had the resources to play golf or they don't know what golf is and I'm trying to introduce them to golf. I mean, I can go to a golf course all day long and talk about golf, but they're already there. We need to go to places that aren't, you know, aren't golf. And I think that's really important. I think we have to do a better job all together of doing that and not just posting what we think works or drives likes or drives engagement. We need to post to actually make a difference. And that, you know, that's something that I really try to do. I post things that are, you know, different or I'll try to push the boundaries because I know that that's kind of pushing what traditional golf is. And I think that's the mindset. We have this idea of what golf is and we need to change that. And we, we need to all try to do that. Thanks so much, Paige. I think that's a great way to, to wrap things up. Um, hope everyone enjoyed our session today on social media best practices and really engaging with millennials. And um, I'll kick things back to Sarah. Thank you, Lauren and the panel for today's webinar presentation.